I am Dr. Charles Feynman, the chair of the Virtual Grand Rounds sessions on type 2 diabetes. I am a former chairman of the Department of Endocrinology, Diabetes, and Metabolism at the Cleveland Clinic and currently a consultant in the department. This is the last lecture in our fourth season of Virtual Grand Rounds, which are CME-approved presentations sponsored by the Cleveland Clinic dealing with type 2 diabetes management. As previously emphasized, type 2 diabetes has become a major health care problem in both this country and the world at large. The Centers for Disease Control estimates that the lifetime risk for diabetes for a person born in America in the year 2000 is about 40% in Caucasians and over 50% in Hispanics and black women. It's not surprisingly, therefore, the pharmaceutical industry has invested heavily in this field. The result has been a proliferation of numerous new agents and classes of agents for management of blood glucose, and more are currently being developed. Clearly, today's topic of next-generation therapies in type 2 diabetes is timely. With this in mind, today's speaker will review and discuss findings and perspectives gleaned from recent studies in this field. It is my pleasure now to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Robert Henry. Dr. Henry is Professor of Medicine at the University of California, San Diego, and Chief of the Section of Endocrinology, Metabolism, and Diabetes at the VA Hospital in San Diego. Among his numerous accomplishments, Dr. Henry is a past president of medicine and science of the American Diabetes Association. He is renowned both nationally and internationally as both a clinical and basic science investigator involved in the study of diabetes, obesity, and metabolism. He is a frequently sought-after lecturer as well. Dr. Henry. Yes, this is Dr. Bob Henry. And I'm going to be talking about next generation of therapies for type 2 diabetes, some, eight, some therapies that um, are in the pipeline, and uh, several that have just recently been approved. As you can see in this uh, slide, um, the topic we're going to be discussing today include the long-acting DPP-4 inhibitor, omarogliptin. I'll be talking about some of the newer insulins the ultra-rapid-acting inhaled insulin, a technosphere or a freeza, the ultra-long-acting basal insulin, U100 degludec. I'll also be talking about some newer long-acting GLP-1 agonists, the diliglutide QW, which was recently approved, and the ITCA 650, which is a pump that delivers um, exenatide up to a year at yearly intervals. And then we'll talk about combination basal insulin, GLP-1 agonist, combination products, Idaglira, and Lexilan. So amarogliptin is a potent, long-acting DPP-4 inhibitor with a half-life of about 60 hours. If you look on the right-hand side of the slide, on the insert, you'll see the plasma concentrations of amarogliptin after an oral dose. And as you can see, it lasts essentially a week long um, in, in terms of serum levels. And so this results in dosing that can, can occur once weekly. It is cleared about 70% by urinary excretion. So the dose will probably uh, have to be reduced with renal impairment uh, that um, the and there is a low drug-drug interaction risk with this medication. In terms of the pharmacodynamics, again, looking at the right side panel, you can see the percent DPP-4 inhibition is greater than 80% in the, over one week at the 25 milligram dose. So there's essentially effective inhibition of DP, DPP-4 for the entire week. And this results in A1 lowering comparable 
to citagliptin at the full dose given once daily. The, obviously, the, the value of taking a once-a-week medication versus once daily is that it's a convenient dosing, and there's a potential for improved adherence and perhaps efficacy. This next slide shows a marogliptin dose ranging study that has been presented at the ESAD in 2012. And it's A1C over a range and placebo controlled uh, study comparing omarogliptin at five different doses from 0.25 milligrams to 25 milligrams in about 115 subjects per group. And you can see that there is a dose response increase in the reduction in A1C up to about 10 milligrams where there seems to be little difference between 10 and 25 milligrams with reductions in uh, A1C of about 0.5 to 0.6 uh, percent uh, or placebo adjusted about 0.7 percent. This is also shown in the slide in the lower part of the slide with each of the um, doses showing fairly prompt reduction uh, over the 12-week uh, of the study. Omeragliptin is also shown in this next slide once weekly compared to once daily citagliptin at 50 milligrams. Both patients start, both groups starting at approximately 8% A1C. You can see there's a nice reduction of about 0.6. Uh, percent uh, in these individuals who started at about 8%, and that there's equivalence between omarogliptin once weekly and uh, citagliptin given once daily. The, this compound is my understanding that this compound uh, will, the NDA will be filed, the new drug application will be filed uh, with the FDA sometime in 2015. So one might expect that it could come to market uh, if approved, uh, probably late 15 or early 2016. Let's move on now to the ultra-rapid acting and alternate alternative insulins in development. As you can see from this slide, there are many forms of rapid and alternative insulins in development. I'm going to talk about the recently improved inhaled insulin technosphere insulin, or Afriza. Afriza is shown in this slide. You can see that it is a rapidly acting inhaled insulin indicated to improve glucose control in adults with diabetes mellitus. It really is a compound of the, um, the particle, the insulin, inhaled insulin particle shown in A, which binds together with a carrier, which is fumaral diketo Pyperazine, and uh, you can see in the right-hand side of this slide, this is the inhaler, very small, easily fits in the palm of a hand, and beside it is one of the cartridges, the blue cartridges, uh, which contains a four units uh, of technosphere insulin. There's also green cartridges, which have eight units uh, in, of, of uh, technosphere insulin. So that you can give mealtime of Frieza doses can range from four to 24 units. This next slide shows a Frieza concept that the recombinant human insulin is absorbed onto the FDKP or fumaral diketopiperazine, and at less than uh, pH of less than six, uh, these there's a adsorption of the insulin onto the FDKP particle. Once it, and that's a pH less than 6. Once it enters the lungs, where the pH is greater than 6, there's rapid separation and dissolution and absorption of the insulin throughout the, uh, throughout the lung. This slide shows the dose absorption proportionality in an open-label four-way crossover study in 32 healthy subjects. You can see in the dotted line is the amount of insulin that is achieved with 15 IU of regular human insulin. This was given and the patient was clamped in a euglycemic clamp. And then 
uh, doses were given of 10, 30, 60, and 80 units of Tecmosphere insulin. You can see the very uh, strong dose proportionality. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, the, the proportionality is approaches one. These are insulin levels that are C-peptide corrected. And uh, there was a, another thing that one should note is that there's fairly large uh, standard deviation in each of these subjects uh, so that um, while the, 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 the dose, each dose gives a mean amount of uh, serum insulin, uh, there is a large degree of individual variability. The, this slide on the left-hand side shows that compared to the rapid subcutaneous acting insulin, that the technosphere insulin has more rapid absorption. That's shown in the right-hand slide again, where the absorption is very rapid, very similar to um, what happens under normal physiologic circumstances with insulin secretion, so that the time to peak serum insulin concentrations is about 14 minutes after the technosphere insulin inhalation. This contrasts with about 60 minutes, again as shown on the right-hand side of this slide, about 60 minutes after subcutaneous rapid-acting analog insulin. And of course, there's much faster insulin elimination of the technosphere insulin. It's about 180 minutes versus about 300 minutes for the rapidly acting insulin. Notice that the doses that are given, which is 20 units of TI, approximates about eight units of rapidly acting insulin. So there's not a one-to-one -one, um, one -one ratio. In fact, it's really that 20 units of technosphere insulin is equivalent to about eight units of the rapidly acting insulin. This study shows the A1C changes at 24 weeks uh, in basal bolus therapy of type 1 diabetic subjects. There were subjects, there was a four-week um, in 100, 174 patients in, uh, in one arm with the technosphere insulin and 170 patients with the aspart insulin added on to basal lantus. Um, there was a, patients came in and uh, there was a four-week basal insulin aspart optimization period, then 12-week prandial insulin titration, followed by a 12-week stable insulin dosing. And you can see that baseline was approximately or close to 8% in both groups. And by 24 weeks, the reduction uh, with the uh, technosphere insulin and basal was 7.73%, a reduction of minus 0.21%. And with the aspart and basal, uh, you, the reduction was minus 0.4%. And it was not inferior. The reductions were... A similar and not in, and the technosphere insulin was not inferior to the aspart when added to basal insulin. Hypoglycemia rates, however, differed significantly. Total number of hypoglycemias uh, with uh, the, uh, you can see, was significantly less with the technosphere insulin. Uh, the total number uh, was 980 with the technosphere insulin, 1,397 with the aspart insulin. This is event rates per 100 subject months with a reduction, the difference between technosphere insulin and aspart of approximately 30%. Severe insulin, in severe hypoglycemia requiring the assistance of another was also quite different. 32 um, incidences or cases or 18.4% versus 50, or 29.2%, uh, with the aspart insulin for a reduction of about 43% with technosphere insulin versus aspart for the development of severe hypoglycemia. So just to summarize the Afriza or technosphere insulin summary, um, the efficacy, Afriza demonstrates dose proportionality of insulin exposure from eight from 10 to 80 units in healthy subjects. Afriza is, has been shown to be non-inferior to rapidly acting insulin for change in A1C when used with basal insulin and type 1 diabetes. 
and a freezer use in type 1 is associated with about a 30 to 40 percent reduction into total and severe hypoglycemia, respectively, compared to rapidly acting insulin. The safety issues is that technosphere insulin is not recommended for current or recent smokers um, who are actively smoking or those at risk of lung cancer. And I should note that they, a decrease in FEV1 of greater than 15% occurred in 6% of the afreza treated patients versus 3%. Um, and this occurred in the first month and lasted over the entire two-year period and results in uh, the, the indication or the uh, that um, pulmonary function tests should be assessed initially and at six months and annually thereafter. Also, in the, this uh, next slide shows that the FDA required a risk evaluation and mitigation strategy uh, based on the safety information. First of all, the risk of bronchospasm in patients with chronic lung disease has been observed. Acute bronchospasm has been observed in patients with asthma and COPD using a freezer. It is contraindicated in patients with chronic lung disease, such as asthma or COPD. And we need to evaluate all patients for lung disease before starting a freezer. So besides a detailed medical history and physical exam, spirometry should be done for an FEV1 to identify post potential lung problems before starting the uh, technosphere insulin or a freezer. Let's then move on to the new basal insulins in the pipeline. As you can see, there are a number of insulins uh, being developed in phase one and phase two, weekly insulins, smart insulins, oral insulins. There are a number in phase three development. And the U100, Degludec Novo Nordisk uh, insulin, is what I'm going to talk about. And it um, has had an NDA submitted and uh, a decision made uh, by uh, the FDA. So insulin Degludec, you can see, is a new ultra-long-acting basal insulin. It forms soluble multihexamers after subcutaneous injection, which gradual release of insulin monomers into the circulation it has a 25-hour half-life with more than 42-hour duration of action and has similar A1C lowering, whether it's dosed at a fixed time frame like daily or at intervals of 8 to 40 hours. This is a study published in Diabetes Care comparing insulin degludec once daily to insulin glargine in diabetic, uh, type 2 diabetic patients who um, were on, um, who were on insulin glargine uh, prior to therapy. And you can see that once the study started, when it was conducted for 52 weeks, there was really no difference in the A1C, very slight differences, uh, non-significant differences in fasting plasma glucose, and the uh, fast and the day-long glucose, uh, you can see pre-breakfast and after breakfast, pre-lunch, after lunch, and before and after dinner. You can see that they got significant reductions with both insulin degludec and insulin glargine that were comparable throughout the entire uh, period, 52-week uh, study period. The only difference that was found was in the nocturnal hypoglycemia was uh, there was evidence of reduced nocturnal hypoglycemia with degludec, which began to appear at about week 24 and got greater um, so that by the end of 52 weeks, there was a 36% lower rate of nocturnal hypoglycemia with insulin degludec versus insulin glargine. So the summary for degludec, uh, it compared to insulin glargine once daily in combination with oral anti-diabetic agents for one year provided similar glycemic control, minus 1.06 with the degludec and minus 1.19% with the glargine, and uh, equal weight gain or comparable weight gain, 2.4 and 2.1 kilograms with the degludec versus glargine respectively. Similar end-of-trial daily doses of about 0.6 units per kilogram body weight 
but lower rates of nocturnal hypoglycemia uh, in patients treated with Degludec compared to Glargine. So now we're going to talk about the pipeline and the approved GLP-1 receptor agonists. Obviously, there again, is a large number of compounds that are being studied uh, in both phase one and phase two, uh, as well as uh, phase three. Uh, the ITCA-650 is in phase three studies. Semaglutide, uh, the weekly uh, com- compound, is uh, currently in phase three. And we're going to talk about the ITCA-650 uh, pump yearly pump or administration of exenatide, as well you can see the approved compounds, and I'm going to speak about the most recently approved uh, GLP-1 receptor agonist, diliglutide, once weekly. Diliglutide is a recombinant GLP-1 FC fusion protein that links human GLP-1 peptide together with a variant of human IgG FC fragment This combination gives an extended plasma half-life of about five days. There's minimal renal clearance, and you can administer it once weekly uh, with with considerable efficacy. It it comes as a a solution. There's no reconstitution uh, necessary. It either can be administered by a pen, which is... um, a device which injects either point um, that that injects the uh, diliglutide at the different dosages, and it has uh, a low in, uh, immunogenic pr- potential. So it, the uh, diliglutide is available either in pen form or in syringe form. Studies that have been done with diliglutide have been generally under the term award studies. And this is a generalized study design of the diliglutide studies. Essentially, all of them underwent a background uh, therapy with a screening and lead-in, which was variable depending upon the study, and I'll describe that. And then patients were randomized either to diliglutide, 1.5 milligrams, 0.75 milligrams, or to the comparator, and uh, were studied for a variable period of time and generally followed up for safety after that. So this background period here was, uh, again, variable, and I'm going to just show now the various diliglutide trials. Uh, This is the phase three um, uh, studies that were done, Uh, and I'm going to talk about award three, which is versus metformin in drug-naive or patients washed out on one oral anti-diabetic agent. The award five, which compares diliglutide to citagliptin as an add-on to metformin. Or the award one, which it compares diliglutide to exenatide, diliglutide once weekly to exenatide twice daily as an add-on to metformin and thiazolidine dione. The uh, studies, the phase three studies, award one through award six are complete. There are three additional studies, award seven, eight, and uh, as well as the rewind study, which is a long-term cardiovascular outcome study that are still ongoing. The A1C results are shown here. In the award three, uh, you can see that uh, this is a 26-week study, and this study, um, uh, you can see at the end of the 26 weeks, there were significantly greater reductions in uh, the A1C in both the, one, uh, the 0.75 and the 1.5 diliglutide uh, compared uh, to the, um, the metformin. In the award five, which is versus citagliptin, uh, you can see again a, a significantly greater reduction in the A1C, starting at about 8.1% and going down 0.87% with the 0.75 diliglutide and minus 1.10 with the 1.5 milligrams of diliglutide. In the award one study, which was the head-to-head versus exenatide uh, twice daily uh, at the maximum dose, you can see, again, significantly greater reductions with the weekly diliglutide compared 
to the exenatide. Weight changes also showed significant reductions uh, with um, both of, uh, with the uh, compared to placebo or to baseline with both the doses of dilaglutide in the award three as well as the award five. In the award one, where uh, they were comparing to exenatide, uh, the there was a um, in the the control. Uh, these patients were on basal bolus therapy. Uh, these individuals, you can see that there was a significant reduction with the 1.5 millima- uh, milligrams of dilaglutide, but a, a no weight reduction, but a blunting of the weight gain that occurred uh, in the placebo uh, basal bolus uh, therapy. So uh, just to summarize the dilaglutide then, there were significant glycemic effects, which I didn't show, on both fasting and postprandial glucose, but superior A1C reductions from baseline compared to the active comparators, whether it be the metformin, the citagliptin, or the exenatide, in studies ranging from 26 to 52 weeks. And that's with both the 1.5 and the 0.75 milligram at the primary endpoint. And the dilaglutide 1.5 milligram demonstrated consistent dose Uh, dependent sustained weight loss. The safety of dilaglutide, the most common treatment emergent adverse events were similar to other GLP-1 receptor agonists with gastrointestinal um, problems being uh, the major uh, adverse events with nausea in about 20 to 25 percent, mostly mild and moderate and transient in nature, as well as diarrhea in about 10 to 15 percent as well as vomiting. And again, dilaglutide, when used uh, without hypoglycemic, uh, with other hypoglycemic potentiating agents, has a very low risk of hypoglycemia. And in the studies, no severe uh, episodes of severe hypoglycemia. We're now going to move on to the ITCA 650 pump. This uh, pump is shown in the next slide. And you can see that it is a subcutaneously placed mini-osmotic pump about the size of a small matchstick. It delivers the in the exenatide, which is uh, in the pump, in a zero-order kinetics, which means it's a constant, steady delivery of drug uh, for up to one year. So uh, it, you don't get the peaks and valleys that you do with injectable therapies. And uh, you also don't get the troughs that might be associated with suboptimal therapy with this, aid, with this uh, delivery technology. The peptide stabilizing sepsis uh, suspension, so it's exenatide together with this unique formulation, which stabilizes the peptide um, with, uh, at high body temperatures for up to 12 months from just a single device. And uh, the device can be placed uh, in a short inter- or in-office uh, sterile procedure, which takes about 15, maybe 20 minutes sometimes. Uh, as you can see, the pump is very interesting. It, it, uh, you can see the size of it, the person holding it in the hand. It's again, about the size of a matchstick. At one end is a semi-permeable osmotic membrane that the, uh, when placed in the subcutaneous or the subdermal space, the interstitial fluid will go through this osmotic membrane, and uh, the osmotic engine is shown in the middle here, and that's really a salt tablet, so that when the fluid comes in and the salt uh, tablet dissolves over time, it pushes the piston at a constant rate, uh, again, through the uh, diffuse moderator with, again, the constant and steady release of immediate, uh, immediate release of exenatide. The study I'm going to talk about in this slide is the ITCA 650 Freedom 1 study. The Freedom 1 study was one of the many studies being done in the phase three. Um, and you can see that the uh, Freedom 1 is a double-blind, randomized, multi-center, and placebo-controlled uh, study to evaluate the efficacy and safety of the ITCA 650 
in patients with metformin, sulfonylureas, TZD monotherapy, or any combination of metformin, sulfonylurea, and TZD who had an A1C between 7.5 and 10. And this study is um, actively being conducted at this time. But I'm going to talk to you about a sub-study, which uh, has, not, has just recently been completed. But I, uh, the data is not available from the complete study, but I'm going to show you uh, some of the data, uh, interim analysis, in a subpopulation of this group who met all inclusion criteria for the Freedom One study, but the A1C was too high uh, for patients to be ra randomized in a placebo randomized fashion because the hemoglobin A1C was greater than, it had to be, was, in these individuals, was greater than 10, but less than or equal to 12%. They could then um, all get enrolled uh, to, uh, to evaluate changes in A1C and body weight at weeks 13, 19, and 26. So the basic study design is shown here. And it is the same for the Freedom 1 as it is for the Freedom 1 high baseline study that I'm going to talk about. Of course, a four-week patient screening period. 13, for the first 13 weeks, the, um, the ITCA 650 pump was placed subdermally uh, at the low dose to allow uh, tolerance to develop. Uh, and, uh, and so the infusion uh, was 20 micrograms per day constantly. At 13 weeks, the device was uh, replaced in the same spot it was taken out of, replaced with the 60 microgram per day dose. And this was done for uh, 26 weeks and then a four-week follow-up period after device removal. So remember, this is interim analysis. Is so med like this study has only uh, been completed within the last few months. So the data that I'm going to show you is just from patients that uh, completed different uh, parts of the or times of the study. You can see the number of patients in this slide, uh, and we um, are going to show you 50 patients who completed uh, 13 weeks of. Uh, the ITCA 650, uh, and um, the that is uh, that dose was at the 20 micrograms because the first 13 weeks was at the 20 microgram per day dose. And then we're going to show you uh, 39 patients who completed 19 weeks. So that would have been they did the 13 plus another six weeks on the six, 60 microgram per uh, per day dose, and then 25 subjects. Who went for the full 20? For went for the 26 weeks. So look at the, the results are shown on the A1C uh, at each of these intervals. Again, this is not the full data set, but at 13 weeks, the 50 patients, there was a reduction, a mean from 10.8 down to 8.3, for a mean reduction of 2.5 percent on the 20 micrograms per day. After it had been bumped up for um, uh, for six weeks, for a total of 19 weeks of therapy, from it went down 2.9%. Uh, and after 26 weeks, in 25 patients, it went down 3.2%. So significant reductions from baseline to the end point of, uh, of this study, a gain of about 3.2% in A1C. This slide shows the proportion of patients achieving and a specific A1C reduction, and I'll explain it to you, for you. This is the percentage of patients um, uh, uh, and uh, versus the reduction in A1C. So you see that 78% of the patients who were studied at that at uh, at at 13 at least 13 weeks of treatment had a reduction in A1C of at least 2%. 50% of the patients that were studied at, 13, at least 13 weeks had at least a 3% reduction, 22% had at least a 4% reduction, 8% had at least a 5% reduction, and 2% had at least a 6% reduction. Only two patients had a reduction of less than or equal to 0.5%. This would be considered the people that are resistant to GLP-1 
or non-responsive for some other reason. This slide shows uh, just an, an example of A1Cs for individual patients who got an A1C reduction of 4% or greater from baseline. And you can see uh, the range uh, in patients. You can see uh, starting at minus 4% change in A1C to as much as 6.2%. So that 22% of patients studied in this interim analysis had A1C reductions of at least 4%. Adverse events were, again, similar to other GLP-1 receptor agonists. Nausea, about 28%. Vomiting, 18%. Diarrhea, similarly at 18%. And hypoglycemia, all minor, um, the, about 5%. And uh, minor hypoglycemia was defined when the glucose was less than 60 milligrams per deciliter. As you can see, there were six discontinuations from the study. One was lost to follow-up, one from hyperglycemia, four from adverse events, including two cases of nausea and vomiting, one of diarrhea, and one of sudden cardiac death unrelated to the study drug. So in conclusion, in this interim analysis of the ITCA 650, there were mean reductions of greater than 3% in patients who had reached 26 weeks of treatment and had started off with an A1C of between 10% and 12%. These effects were achieved with 100% adherence, and the ITCA 650 obviously has the potential, potential to markedly improve glucose control with long-standing severe hyperglycemia and long-standing diabetes from this study. Finally, in the last uh, part of the talk, I'm going to talk about the concept of combining insulin, long-acting insulin, with a GLP-1 receptor agonist. These combinations, there are two that are in the pipeline. There's Ideglira, which is, uh, we'll talk about, and Lexilan. And the concept is to add basal insulin therapy and GLP-1 therapies to augment the benefits of both and to offset the potential downsides of, um, of insulin therapy, such as to minimize the weight gain and uh, to minimize the hypoglycemia and to have beneficial effects, as you can see, on um, uh, the, that occur with the GLP-1 receptors, uh, receptor agonists together with basal insulin. So the combinations that I'm going to talk about briefly, include ideglira, which is degludec together with liraglutide in a fixed ratio combination, and lexiland, which is insulin glargine plus lexazenatide in a fixed ratio combination. This slide shows the concept of how the insulin degludec is combined with the liraglutide. Uh, you can see that there's a fixed Again, a fixed ratio of liraglutide on the vertical axis and insulin degludec on the horizontal axis. You can see that it's a, uh, a fixed ratio so that at the maximum, 1.8 milligrams of liraglutide is combined with 50 units of uh, insulin degludec. This study is in type 2 diabetes for comparing ideglira the combination of degludec and liraglutide to, against uh, insulin degludec uh, and then comparing as well to liraglutide at 1.8 milligrams. And this is in people who are on background metformin and pioglitazone uh, and patients in the IDEG lira and in the IDEG uh, arms. They had a treat to target of 72 to 90 milligrams per deciliter, and uh, you could undergo dose adjustments in a 202 or twice weekly fashion. The raglatide, of course, was uh, started at the low dose, 0 0.6, then up to 1.2, and then 1.8 milligrams uh, throughout uh, the remainder of the 26 weeks. It was again a, um, uh, an open label study. In type, the individuals who had type 2 diabetics with an A1C between 7 and 10 percent, despite being treated with metformin and/or pioglitazone, and uh, insulin naive, 
And again, they were um, had to have a BMI of less than 40. So let's see, the results of this trial are shown in the next slide, the A1C over time for the insulin degladec and the liraglutide were very similar, reductions uh, of about 1.3 to 1.4 percent uh, with uh, the degludec and the liraglutide. But when you, in the insulin uh, degludec, the IDEG lira, reductions that were significantly greater at almost 2 percent, 1.91 percent, so that the A1C went from a starting of about 8.3 down to 6.4% after 24 weeks of study. The fasting glucose is shown in this slide in a similar fashion. The uh, IDEG, uh, the, uh, the liraglutide had the uh, least reduction. You can see that the reduction was prompt uh, and uh, at up to about five weeks of study. And then uh, the fasting glucose remained uh, stable and reduced by about 32 milligrams per deciliter, so that at the end of study, they were down from uh, about 160 down to around 130. When you look at the degludec, a nice reduction in the fasting plasma glucose and uh, reductions as well with the IDEG lira, uh, um, similarly reducing it by about 65 milligrams per deciliter down to end of trial glucoses of approximately 100 to 105 milligrams per deciliter. So um, the IDEG lira was, this reduction was significantly greater than the IDEG lira, than the liraglutide alone. About body weight and hypoglycemia, you can see that in the top uh, part of this slide that with the IDEG lira, with the uh, insulin degludec, there was a weight gain of approximately three pounds. Uh, with the uh, IDEG lira, that, uh, the, that, that weight gain was um, blocked, and in fact, there was a, a weight reduction of about one pound, and that compared with weight reduction of about, uh, about five or six pounds with the liraglutide. So clearly, the IDEG lira blunts the weight gain that would occur uh, with the degludec um, in this study. The rates of hypoglycemia uh, with uh, the IDEG lira was less than uh, the uh, insulin degludec, and of course the liraglutide rates were the lowest uh, at 0.22 episodes per, um, uh, per year, uh, patient year exposures. So the summary of the efficacy results is that titrated IDEG lira added to metformin and or pioglitazone for 26 weeks in type 2 diabetes reduced the A1C uh, by almost 2%. It reduced the fasting by about 65 milligrams per deciliter, was associated with reduced body weight of about a kilo, and reduced hypoglycemia compared to degludec. So this Moving to the uh, Lexiland now, the Lexiland proof of concept study. Uh, this was presented at the ADA this last year and at the ESAD by Rosenstock uh, from uh, Dallas, Texas. And uh, this is, again, a single injection combining lantus and lexazenatide, again, in a fixed ratio. You can see the ratios on the right-hand side, two units of lantus or glargine, together with one microgram of lexazenatide, and you can see the various combinations uh, to a maximum uh, of 60 units of insulin and 30 micrograms of lexazenatide. Um, and the pen, you can, uh, the doses can be titrated, uh, and the, only the dose of lantus appears in the window here. So, but again, it's a fixed ratio uh, that'll be given. The study that was presented uh, was an open-label, uh, two-arm, parallel, 24-week treat-to-target trial with, uh, in 162 patients uh, with um, uh, Lantus and metformin, added to metformin, uh, compared to Lexilan in the, added to metformin in 161 patients. Again, the maximum dose for the Lexilan was 60 units 
uh, of glargine and 30 micrograms of lexazenatide. These patients uh, had type 2 diabetes uh, for a mean duration of 6 to 7 years, 90 kilos in weight, BMI 32, and a fasting of about 170 milligrams per deciliter. The baseline A1C was approximately 8%. And you can see with both arms, the Lantus and the Lexiland, plus the metformin, they were titrated daily adjustments to try and achieve fasting targets of 80 to 100 milligrams per deciliter. The efficacy results are shown here. The A1C changes were the baseline A1C was about 8% in both the combination, the Lexiland combination or the Lantus, but the reductions were 1.8% 1, 1 with Lexiland and minus 1.6 with the Lantus, and so not um, the, the similar different reductions with the two. Body weight, however, was uh, significantly uh, reductions in body weight with the Lex with the uh, Lexazenita uh, with the Lexilan uh, compared to the uh, Glargine or Lantus, as well greater glucose excursions in the postprandial state uh, during the study, with reductions of about four millimolar or approximately 70 milligrams per deciliter in uh, postprandial glucose with the Lexilan compared to the glargine. This slide shows the efficacy results, and again, the percentage of A1C responders was that were able to get an A1C less than or equal to 7 was 84% with the Lexiland, 78% with the glargine, and less than 6.5 uh, or less was 72% uh, with the Lexilan, 65% with the glargine. And you can see uh, the response rates with no documented hypoglycemia and no weight gain in the Lexilan versus Lantus, uh, shown on the left-hand side of this slide. So a summary of the efficacy results are that titrated Lexilan added to metformin reduced A1C from 8.1 to 6.3, there was reduced postprandial glucose and reduced body weight of approximately one kilo, and 84% of patients got an A1C of less than 7%, 64% uh, uh, without documented hypoglycemia, 56% with no weight gain, and 46% with no weight gain or documented hypoglycemia. The profiles, uh, is, as you can see, the adverse events were similar uh, to what we would see uh, with uh, in, with a nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea with uh, the Lexiland containing the lexazenatide GLP-1 receptor agonist. So um, finally, uh, that's the completion of, of uh, the presentation, but I just want to say at the very final that uh, although we've got many therapies coming through, uh, the pipeline in type 2 diabetes, there continues to be a number of unmet needs uh, particularly in insulin resistance. We need safe, effective insulin sensitizers. Unfortunately, there are uh, very few um, that are in development. Uh, diabetes complications uh, continue to be a problem, both macrovascular and microvascular. And uh, again, there are, there are agents uh, that are in study for both these uh, micro and macrovascular complications. We need agents that significantly impact the natural history of the beta cell decompensation uh, and agents that have minimal or no primary or secondary failure. And finally, there's a large emerging um, area and target of uh, targeting the microbiome, the gut bacteria, which appears to have significant effects in type 2 diabetes and is a very um, but it has a strong potential uh, for um, thera therapies directed against the microbiome, the abnormal microbiome. That's the end of my presentation, and I'd like to thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Henry, for navigating us so insightfully through the sea of new agents and combination of agents for the management of type 2 diabetes. Some may prove useful for type 1 patients as well. Whether or not such agents will also fulfill another expectation, 
namely beta cell preservation, and prove useful in halting or reversing the natural history of progressive beta cell failure in type 2 diabetes must remain subjects for future study. Not mentioned in Dr. Henry's presentation is where medical or surgical attacks on obesity will fit into future management strategies. Clearly, weight loss by any means has a favorable impact on cardiovascular risk factors. Moreover, gastric bypass surgery in the obese individual with diabetes can have a markedly positive outcome. As shown by recently well-controlled randomized trials, this surgical procedure can result not only in better control, but even in remission of diabetes in some instances. Moreover, there is a positive impact on longer-term morbidity and mortality. Permit me to underscore the major take-home messages as I see them. First, lifestyle interventions remain the cornerstone of treatment. Second, one must recognize that a multiple risk factor approach is required. This includes attention to weight, exercise, smoking cessation, and a multiple pharmacologic approach to glucose, lipids, and blood pressure. Third, Noteworthy from population studies, the risk of dying from diabetes, as well as cancer and other deaths, all begin to rise at a hemoglobin A1C level of 6 to 6.5%. Thus, the current general consensus is that a hemoglobin A1C level of less than 7% is a reasonable goal. This can be safely reached in the majority of patients with type 2 diabetes. In the older population, with a history of cardiovascular disease, even this goal may be too stringent, so that a relaxed number is quite acceptable. It should be emphasized that hypoglycemia should be avoided at all costs in this population. But in younger patients, with a more recent onset and no known cardiovascular complications, a more aggressive hemoglobin A1C goal of less than 6.5% is recommended. Fourth, the explosion in the number of therapeutic options over the past number of years can be daunting to the practitioner. Not only have more classes of drugs appeared on the scene, but also competing analogs within each class are now available. And, as we have heard, more will be on the way. Taken together, these agents have provided the practitioner with a number of options to help individualize treatment. And I emphasize the word individualize, so that more patients will be able to reach the recommended targets safely, and effectively. The result will be healthier and more productive lives. Finally, since this is the last in our current series, let me leave you with what I think will be the major challenge facing the country in health care and diabetes in particular. The prevalence of diabetes continues to rise, partly due to obesity and partly to aging. Public Health measures will need to be strengthened to help deal with prevention strategies. It is clear that lifestyle factors are paramount in risk reduction for new onset type 2 diabetes. Programs need to be directed first to school-age children and adolescents. Encouraging healthy diets and exercise and, at the same time, discouraging countless hours spent with wireless and often thoughtless, communication should be a priority. Prevention and management of type 2 diabetes will require increased resources. In particular, there will not be enough physicians to help manage diabetes effectively. That is, good quality care without rationing. 
Here is where a multidisciplinary team of physicians, nurses, educators, and dietitians will prove essential. Governments must recognize that delivery of first-rate care to the majority of this country's citizens will require considerable thought and capital outlay. Newer mechanisms for delivery of management advice electronically without necessitating a clinic or emergency department visit will need to be recompensed to the healthcare professional. The country's health and avoidance of future complications will be the reward. In closing, on behalf of myself, Dr. Henry, and the Cleveland Clinic, I wish to thank you for attending this sixth and final session of our fourth virtual Grand Round series on type 2 diabetes.